We offer something you do not, a reason to die. We need not frighten anyone, you do the frightening. Because, you see, people are not frightened to die or to be killed, down deep. Down deep, they are afraid of dying without that death meaning anything. They are afraid that they will die and that a life of playing Xbox and watching your American movies and eating your American food and worshipping themselves will end with them in the ground and their lives forgotten. And of course, they're right. Their lives are meaningless. Hey everybody, and welcome to the next meeting of the St. Balasar University's English Club. I'm your host, Andrew. My fellow Americans, uh, my name is... President Prescott, <laughs> and uh, we have a uh, an exciting and uh, topical uh, text today for the club: uh, "True Allegiance" by one Ben Shapiro, which uh, it says here is a uh, New York Times best-selling author. So, President Prescott, you knew that there would be microphones. You knew that this would be recorded and shared with the world. I know you really love the media. You know, Ben and or the ghostwriter that your corporate and federal overlords have paired you with. You really have a lot to say about the way that society is going. And I think you'll fit right in with the likes of Norman Bhutan and especially William Johnstone. So we're really happy to have you. He ran and he won and he kept on winning. Turned out that his blunt nature and blustery personality worked great. His first campaign slogan don't let them hornswoggle you. In his opening campaign speech, he named three top environmental officers in the state and read off how much they'd received from lobbyists for the environmentalists and how much these environmental groups received from global competitors like the Saudi government. Bubba Davis played politics like he played football. He pushed the line. The press called it swagger. He just called it the Texas way. Jihad! Jihad! <laughs> So, True Allegiance is a very dense and very interrelated ensemble story featuring many people from a variety of geographic locations and walks of life. I would describe True Allegiance as a sort of, uh, yeah, I think an ensemble cast is a good way of putting it. It's really got five main characters, but it also uh, plays with the perspectives of a few others as well. Um, each one tells a different perspective on sort of a, a series of, of simultaneous um, political disasters in the United States. So rather than trying to interweave the entire umpteen golly gee drillion POV characters, we're going to try to take our main characters one by one to really isolate their character arcs. So I think it makes sense that we start with Brett, mm -hmm. our, our stallion of Afghanistan. Yeah, he really is a stallion type. He's a big man with big hands. Did you, did you reopen Trigger Warning and crack open that old tome and uh, compare their, their height and weight? Because it's something I thought about doing, but like then I reached for Trigger Warning and like my hand started to like turn black and necrotic. So I just sort of, <laughs> I, I, I ditched that plan. I did notice a lot of similarities between these two books. I resisted the urge to break into sacred territory, but man, we have a lot to talk about about the similarities between Stallion and Brett Hawthorne. But anyways, this is about Ben Shapiro. Let's focus on you and we will walk you through Brett's adventures. The story opens with him in the middle of a violent conflict in Afghanistan. Brett Hawthorne is the youngest general of all time in America, and because of his ideological differences between himself and his commander-in-chief, President Prescott, he's given this thankless sort of honor of being a part of the United States occupation of Afghanistan. And his uh, his beginning chapter sort of kicks off a, a pattern of uh, giving us extremely detailed backstories for every character that's introduced. So his, his history with President Prescott, who's also one of the principal point of view characters, is it's, it's very, very thorough we'll say. Extremely thorough. So we, yeah, we are introduced to his relationship with President Prescott, and obviously they're at odds because Brett is a rugged individualist and President Prescott is a a, a, a preening ideologue. Yeah, he's a, he's a soy-pilled libcuck, you can say it. 
It's a free country. He's a soy pill libcuck, you might say. But he also meets his, in flashback, his wife, Ellen, through, I think it was the Outdoor Marcus in Charleston, which are beautiful, by the way, highly recommend during his time in uh, the Citadel. Yeah. No, it was pretty bad. Yeah, it was harassment. But, yeah. you know, Ellen knows how to handle them. <laughs> and interestingly, in this string of flashbacks, we have three of them. We have Prescott, Ellen, and then... I don't even remember his earlier name. What was, um... Oh, it was Derek. Derek. Yes. So, Ben, you choose to front load this scene flashing back to Brett's childhood where he meets a man named Derek. And I I can only describe it as an excuse to say the N-word a bunch because Brett as a child is accosted... And Derek is the one who saves him from, you know, any kind of violence. Yeah, it's it really comes across as an excuse to sort of um, victimize Brett right. or contrive scenarios in which Brett can be the victim as a white man of, like, minoritarian violence. That's another pattern that will come up a lot where characters who are not minorities will be victims of minorities or will perceive themselves as victims um <laughs> very interesting which is choice. just it, it's it's interesting it's an interesting choice through a sudden attack on kabul by terrorists brett ends up captured by a what was his name oh yeah the bond villain <laughs> yeah the bond villain a shami. A shami, yeah. Brett's captured by a shami who's kind of set up as our, like, main antagonist. He's like a terrorist to rival Osama bin Laden. But for some reason, he also talks like, I don't know, Goldfinger or Dr. No or something. Where, like, he captures Brett and he drags him into, like, a torture chamber. And he's like, well, 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 if it isn't Colonel Hawthorne. And it's like you can almost see him, like, tapping the tips of his fingers together and stuff. Stroking a cat on his, uh, on his lap. Right. Like, it's easier to imagine, like, Maximilian Pegasus from Yu-Gi-Oh! than it is to <laughs> imagine, like, a hardened career terrorist. Yeah. <laughs> I don't even know what else to say about it. Because, okay, so he's introduced here, but he doesn't really factor into the rest of the story, like, at all. No. For reasons that I think will become clear at the end of the book. But anyway, we have four more point of views to cover. So... Uh, basically, Brett is captured, and then he is eventually freed against his own wishes. This happens much later in the story, but his freeing results in a terror attack being carried out against the U.S. Uh, regardless, he's rescued and brought back home. That sets him even more at odds with President Prescott, who at this point in his character arc is attempting to sort of like institute this new suite of social programs that the narrative of the book is very much against. And in the course of those events, Brett ends up running away from federal agents again. Is that what ends up happening? Pretty right before he meets? much, yeah. He, he goes rogue right. and he needs to find a shami. He knows something big is coming. So that's how he meets back up with the guy from kind of his cold open who has changed his name to Hassan Abdul. And Hassan, formerly Derek, has converted to Islam and wormed his way into kind of the intelligentsia of Islam in America in order to keep track on potential terrorists, who slowly kind of leads Brett to ultimately realizing that something big is going to go down when President Prescott is to announce his big work freedom program. He is briefly reunited with his wife and then separated from her at just in time to learn that she was killed in an explosion on uh, Air Force One along with President Prescott. A nuclear explosion. Yeah. And then Brett meets up with Soledad, another major character, and they uh, they flee into the night. <laughs> they go home. And the book, the book ends on a huge unnecessary cliffhanger with nothing having really changed in the course of the plot so that we've made a sort of a lateral move it just shifted over a bit right to the left you might say yeah oh i wouldn't say that i wouldn't say that <laughs> okay so let's back all the way back to the beginning of the book where we are introduced to our next principal pov character president prescott now 
I can only really describe President Prescott as an amalgamation of a certain kind of person's interpretation of Barack Obama and Bill Clinton. He's not really an analogy for Obama. He's an analogy of what Ben Shapiro or whatever ghostwriter was hired to write this book's interpretation of Obama. Right. And we we are kind of young, but I, I did notice how he was eyeing every single blonde that he could. He was a little bit of a womanizer, and we knew that he had strained relationships with his own wife. So the the Clinton kind of blue dog comparisons kind of write themselves. Yeah, he's just kind of like an insipid, careerist, politician, lefty Democrat. And when I say lefty, I mean like, uh, I mean like liberal. And I mean that in like the, the actual political compass sense of that word liberal. Right. He's, he's not like a leftist. He's on the left, but like in a kind of a pathetic way. <laughs> Pathetic is a really good word for it. He uh, he really only cares about his own legacy, and he's trying to force an idea of his called the Work Freedom Program, which will hopefully, you know, revive the dead economy of the United States and usher in a new era of prosperity. Which the narrative is clearly, as Joshua said, very very against. Yeah, and in case it wasn't like totally clear. Uh, work freedom appears to be a reference to the phrase that was uh, postered above the entrance to certain Nazi concentration camps, Arbeit macht frei, which means work makes freedom. Uh, so I think that that's what Ben was nodding at there. Uh, kind of hard to say for sure one way or the other, but it seems like an odd coincidence if so. We'll have to talk about that more in our like deeper discussions. I, I want to give I want to give Ben the benefit of the doubt uh-huh. just to say that, you know, he wasn't invoking like a, a, a Nazi phrase in his uh, denouncement of the left. I think, y- you know, the, the guy does a good job of making rhetoric that doesn't compare all of his opponents to Nazis, but you do have to wonder. Yeah. You do have to wonder. Um, Prescott's chapters are generally descriptions of how he's trying to move his work freedom program forward. And it is implied that he's doing this at the at the neglect of the situation on the border, which is going to go critical any day now if they let even one more migrant child through the um through the through the United States border. It kind of reminds me of in Empress Teresa how it was implied that like Israel was one day away from being bombed into oblivion and they just had to evacuate everyone. Um, no, Andrew, you don't understand. Some of these kids, they're of gang age and they even have tattoos. <laughs> The, the the little choices of phrase, especially when he's talking about the border or, you know, any minority group of gang age or um, so uh, this is in Brett's point of view. There was a guy named Yard from one of his flashbacks. Oh, who, yeah. And I quote, I'm looking at it right now. Looked like he was headed straight for a lifetime of prison workouts. Yeah. I dream about that phrase. There are a couple moments where I'm just like, this is not the, the not the kind of things you want to be saying, but whatever, man. It's the kind of thing where, like, in a in the hands of a more inexperienced author, um, you might be willing to give them the benefit of the doubt, like not really realize the association that 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 brings in people. Like when you're talking about a minority, and then like something so derogatory like that especially when you never do it with like a white character Mm -hmm. but in the hands of of a benjamin shapiro who is literally a career writer it becomes a a little bit more difficult to uh to assume that that was accidental right and there's not much else to say about president prescott's chapters um other than that he continually ignores what the narrative believes to be warning signs either implies to be warnings in the border crisis or in terms of the narrative is an active threat in terms of Ashami's machinations to to nuke New York City. 
and this ultimately leads to his demise on Air Force One. I think he has two things going for him in his chapters, though. For one, they're the most cerebral. Like, we get in his head the most, and we get his thought process, which I think makes him probably the most, like, alive character in the story. Mm -hmm. Um, And the other thing is that he has the clearest goal of anybody. Uh, He wants to get his policy through, and that makes him relatable in a way that some of the other characters are not, in my opinion. You can you can sympathize with him and also recognize that he's like kind of a piece of scum who's just doing it for his career and to boost his own image. But at least he has a clear goal. Right. Yeah, no, he was my favorite character. And it's probably just because, like Joshua said, he was the only one with a very, very clear goal and ambition beyond what the narrative demanded of him. His story has stakes. Like he compares himself to FDR and JFK and other presidents who have had great photos taken of them and who have carved a space for themselves in the in the history textbooks um he wants to be like that and uh that's a it's a motivation that like can at least be understood the SWAT team didn't expect it the first time she brought them cookies nobody brings the SWAT team cookies so speaking of the border uh, and the in the imminent border crisis, I, I love this idea that the that the United States is like a wet paper bag, and it all it's going to take is like one migrant child that's like one drop of water to make the the whole bottom just fall out of it. Like <laughs> we're just we're we're <laughs> man, it's just so it's insane. Um. So anyway, speaking of the border, Soledad is a rancher who is at war with the uh, EPA. Because she needs to feed her cattle. Mm-hmm. Uh, she is she just needs water to like water her cattle and whatever. But uh, the water that she needs to use is running out because it's like the desert. <laughs> and uh, the there's like a fish, like the smelt, I think it is. The, yeah, the smelt. That uh, it is endangered by her needing to water her cattle. So yeah, Ramirez, uh, Soledad Ramirez contracts with criminals or convinces her her friends to be criminals and bomb the EPA office right, that's when what it is. no one's around. And this has led to a standoff between her and the SWAT team. Yeah, so she's basically under house arrest uh, unofficially. Like, literally, she's just, like, trapped in her own home. Um, mm-hmm. However, the thing that's keeping the SWAT team at bay is, like, a group of vigilante militiamen yes. who are... Uh, I guess, I think they're implied to be fellow ranchers or at least like people who are against the, the, the leftist EPA that wants to stifle American freedoms. Uh, and so that they, they are armed and they're just holding the, the feds at bay essentially. Eventually though, tensions get too high and she and them are forced to flee and they basically are on the run for most of the book. Yeah. So she is able to escape through the defection of Aiden Foster a former SWAT agent who realizes that he sympathizes with the plight of Soledad Ramirez and basically leads her on a trek that hits a point where she kind of loses steam. Both the character and the narrative yeah. realize that she's just a rancher and all she wanted was to take care of her cows. I guess just due to that ennui, I really had trouble following the motivation here they decide to break out aiden foster's friend ricky o'sullivan which we'll get to in a second which we will get to in a second um this ultimately leads her through I, i guess really a comedy of errors where she forces her fellow ranchers and militiamen into more and more you know, perilous positions until they free Ricky O'Sullivan and then they are drone striked. Yep. Drone stricken in Tennessee. Yep. Killing Aiden Foster and galvanizing, I I suppose, her position against the federal government. She really does lack a clear reason to fight the government so directly up until this point, which is a shame because this comes really late in the story. So it really meanders until this point. Super late. So she takes a 3D printed gun to President Prescott's announcement of the Work Freedom Program, tries to assassinate President Prescott, but it's only because of Brett Hawthorne noticing that she's up to no good in the crowd that she is foiled in her plans. 
And of course, Brett is blamed for the attempted assassination. Yep. And then because Brett is on the run and she's on the run, that's why they end up being allies a few chapters later when the novel ends. Right. And in, in literally the epilogue. Yeah. So that's her story. Um, I have some thoughts about her story, but we can get to that in the critique section. In the meantime, I think we should talk about Levon. Absolutely. So um, this is another character who's like clearly an allegory for something. Basically, he's like a well-educated black man in Detroit who's also like a kingpin for like a, a drug mm-hmm. dealing ring and like money ring. Just like a crime. He's like a crime guy, basically. Yeah. He's like a, he's just like, you know, he's like a crime guy that you would he's have. He's a crime, crime guy. Uh, he does the crimes with the criminals and they, they do it for him when he says to. Um, he allies himself with like a black preacher who has a, a better standing in the community than he does in order to sort of contrive a scenario in which a white police officer shoots a young black boy. Um, And it's just so, it's just so not how anything works. Um, Just the fact that like, oh, so, so what happens is uh, Levon and Big Jim, who is the preacher, They contrive a scenario in which a white police officer, Ricky O'Sullivan, who is Aiden Foster's friend, coincidentally, um, is alone in a convenience store at night with a young black boy who he then shoots out of fear. So then, of course, that sparks like a whole media outrage thing, um, and it allows Levon to become the de facto mayor of Detroit, essentially, by ousting the current mayor from power, not officially, but, you know, in practice, and that's that's kind of his his character arc. Um, he just he just kind of does it, and uh, it's supposed to be like a allegory for like Black Lives Matter. I, I don't know. It's it's clumsy and it's it's fragile. Um, it's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And then by the end of the book, he's he he runs the basically every major city in America indirectly due to the sudden loss of a lot of America's police and military due to the you know bombing and we are left to to fear the reign of terror of levon yeah so he's kind of like uh he's still a crime guy doing crime in the shadows but this time his crime is like being the secret mayor of all the cities all of them right even yours right now (laughs) (laughs) so that that bombing you mentioned though we haven't we haven't really talked about that yet because that's sort of ellen's deal so Ellen is Brett's wife. Um, you know, honestly, props to Ben for giving her like a role in the narrative and like making her a major point of view character. I was yeah. surprised by that. Um, sure. She doesn't feel that fleshed out, but like, it's nice that she's there. It is nice that she's there. <laughs> her- hers is kind of like a middleman point of view between several of the others. It like ties them together. It ties together uh, Brett's and Prescott's because she talks to both of them at various points Um, and basically her deal is she works for Bubba Davis, who's like the, what is he, the governor of Texas? Yeah, he's the governor of Texas. She's the, she's his chief of staff. Yeah. So she works for Bubba Davis, the governor of Texas. And Bubba Davis is like kind of a burgeoning, uh, Texas separatist. It seems like he's about ready to split Texas off from the rest of the union in order to deal with the, the quote unquote border crisis. And as his chief of staff, She's responsible for kind of keeping Prescott off their asses. Um, She does as much as she can do, but she isn't able to, I don't know, keep the tensions low. They still end up fighting all the time. She ends up, I don't even know. How does she end up back in New York? I think Prescott calls her there to show her that he has, uh, I almost called him Jake. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So that, that reunites them. And then, you know, I guess... Prescott basically takes her and Jay, uh, um, not, not Jake, Brett, Brett, Brett prisoner, Brett escapes and she ends up on air force one and she doesn't stop the imam from detonating the nuke over New York city and then is posthumously labeled as a terrorist and sets up her her former boss, Bubba Davis, for 
a a quite literal civil war against the federal government. Yeah, with with Prescott dead and her gone, it kind of pushes him over the edge and he decides he's just going to split Texas off from the rest of the union. Right. Because while while Prescott was too busy, you know, wasting his time with you know, thousands and thousands of dead people after a bridge was bombed by an active threat from without. Uh, he was ignoring the super important conflict of 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 Mexican crime and and migrant children who are steadily becoming of gang age. Imminently of gang age. In- <laughs> Imminently, you might say, of gang age. That's the oh thing about God. gang age. It's always it's always uh, coming, but does it ever arrive? It does actually. It's seventeen. Seventeen. When you get your first tattoo. Right. Right. Then right. you're of gang age. <laughs> when you cross the U.S. Mexico border at seventeen with a tattoo. Oh my god. Um, they give you a little a little honorary gang uh, medal, and then uh, I don't know. They send you off to like the the streets of L.A. or something. <laughs> so if it sounds like we're having a horrible horrible time trying to summarize this, it's because this book um, is kind of a mess chronologically even sometimes chapters will work their way up to like a certain point in the narrative and then the next chapter will follow that chronologically and then the chapter after that will happen simultaneous to the chapter that happened two chapters ago um, in order to catch the third character up to where the first character is if that makes sense there's a lot of i would call attempted cliffhangers yeah there is a lot of attempted cliffhangers Yeah, there's times where, like, stuff will just happen, and then in the next chapter will be, it'll be explained how that occurred in the past, and I think that's because thriller movies sometimes do that, uh, where, like, you know, a character who was previously thought dead will, like, appear and save some other characters, and then in the next scene we'll see how the previously thought dead character escaped death and then worked their way back up to being able to reunite with the other characters or something. Um, But it really just, it, it doesn't, it doesn't work here for whatever reason. I think we didn't even really talk about the the bridge bombing that occurs, like sort of across Brett, Ellen, and Prescott's storylines. It's just a terrorist attack that's used to move forward the next part of uh, kind of the 75% mark and then the climax. Yeah, it just kind of like occurs somewhere in the middle of the story and then everybody sort of like reacts to it. Mm-hmm. And then that just kind of leads to the explosion of air force one sorta sorta the the connections between all these events feel very thin and tangential there's a lot of leaps in facts and logic yeah there isn't a great sense of progression or momentum or uh ramping up of of tension it just it feels like stuff is occurring and it sure did occur not even in like a empress Teresa episodic kind of way right it's just like this long thread of events that, that don't build towards a real conclusion. And we begin the book with Brett in danger in Afghanistan, you know, in, in enemy territory. And we end the book with Brett in enemy territory, this time at home, but like still under threat of uh, various enemies. He hasn't grown or changed as a person. And uh, that's it. But this time he's in enemy territory, but it's America. Bum, bum, bum. I mean, if you think about it, like Brett, so Brett at the end of the novel hasn't changed from where he was at the beginning. Um, Soledad has kind of changed. Like, it, you could describe her in such a way that she's changed, but in principle, she's the same person. Um, Prescott and Ellen are both dead. Uh, and Levon is more powerful now, like politically speaking, but personality wise. It doesn't feel like he's grown that much, and he didn't really have to do that much to get where he is. Events just sort of contrived themselves so that he's in a position of uh, more power now. Jennifer screamed, but it was drowned out in the ear-splitting cracking noise. Hundreds of thousands of tons of steel twisting and bending and grating on each other, the sound of a million airplanes all crashing at once. Jennifer looked to her left as she heard steel cable shriek stretch on the other side of the bridge. She locked eyes with an elderly man driving a silver Lincoln Continental. Behind him, she saw one of the enormous metal cables snap clean and slither wildly back and forth like a... and slither... This is a fucking long sentence. Behind him, she saw one of the enormous cables snap clean and slither wildly back and forth like a beginning fly fisherman's messy cast. Look out, she shouted at the man. He couldn't hear her. 
but he turned to follow her eyes. The cable ripped through the Lincoln, slicing its occupant in half vertically, a jet stream of red following in its wake, splattering Jennifer's windshield. She opened her mouth to scream and realized that she was already screaming so hard no sound was emerging. In front of her, the road itself began to tilt. Cars slid horizontally towards the railings. Bath time playthings of an angry god. That's such a... <laughs> I love these. I love these analogies. They're so good. It's like... It's so violent, but it's such a juvenile violence. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. So, Andrew, uh, what did you like about this book? What I really most enjoyed about this book was the skill at which it appealed to very, very base emotions. It, when I was reading it, I would kind of turn my brain off a little bit and let myself get swept up in the you know, the injustice and the uh, the rugged individualism of pretty much every single one of our main characters. But I, I think especially Soledad, I was like, you know, even as stupid as the the situations were, I was really kind of, I guess, rooting for them in a way. It's a very schoolyard bully kind of way of, of viewing the world that, you know, you have no power and someone else holds all of it just above your head. I found it really compelling. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Um, I had a hard time turning my brain off and ex accessing that same level of just unquestioning, non-critical uh, enjoyment, I guess. it's just It just all feels so contrived. Well, sure, yeah, but I mean, I guess I'm more uh, susceptible to propaganda. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe I'm a great candidate for, like, federal radicalization or something none of us are immune to propaganda i guess <laughs> there were some ideas that i liked and i want to talk about this more later but um the beginning part of soledad's chapter where it talks about her personal history with this one worker that she sponsored and then his kid got killed yeah um and then she she despite the fact that her farm was failing like paid for his whole funeral and stuff that was like moving in concept that's what I mean, though. That's like, you know, you turn your brain off. That's really, that's really nice. But I come to the, I come to a book to be told a story, not to like be told that there is a story hypothetically somewhere and you just have to imagine it for yourself. Like that's what the book is for. <laughs> oh yeah. No, the story is to imagine that story in, in real life, you know, in, in America today. Yeah. I mean, it is ripped straight from the headlines. <laughs> this all really happened. I liked, uh, if I say Jake one more time, I like Brett and Ellen's relationship a lot. Uh, it did seem a little bit over militarized with the, the whole take a bullet for you, babe sign off that they do. Oh yeah. You think which is a little bit, a little bit morbid if you really think about it for too long, but it, it's weird too, that they, they rarely have seen each other over the last like 10 years of their marriage, but their sign off for every phone call is, Take a bullet for you, babe. I guess, I don't know. I guess that's military relationships. I w I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't know either. But it, it does kind of seem like they would not know each other that well. Right. Practically speaking. Well, you know, maybe it's the, uh, the, the idea of them that they're in love with. Oh, my God. I mean, that's what this book really trades in, I think, is ideas. Sure. Concepts that, uh, that are easy to recognize um, and instinctively, like, agree with. Because I, I really think that this book exists to be sold to a certain audience. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's trading in recognition. Like, people reading this will say, oh, I recognize Levon. He's like a Black Lives Matter guy. I don't like Black Lives Matter. I like this book because it showed me a thing that, that I recall and agree with. Right, yeah. That, um, you know, it's not so much they are, you know, flesh and blood people, but they're, they're people that kind of, you can you can look at their figure and be like, oh, I kind of recognize that, as though... They were figures made of straw. Yeah. You know, straw men, yeah. in a way. Like a scare... Oh, got you. Um, yeah, like a straw man. Like a straw man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's got to be more good things than that, though. The, the prologue for all of its silly little analogies was really harrowing. I mean, obviously, you had an ample amount of things to draw on in real life with real life tragedies for it. But at the same time, it's a pretty good, you know, bloody way of opening up your novel. I thought that was uh, 
thought that was pretty interesting. I personally think that uh, grabber scenes like that, which is I think what they're called in like the thriller fiction sub community, are like kind of a cliche in and of themselves, and are like they're kind of like the twist ending, you know, like should be used only with great caution. But I did like, I did like how it turned out that the fact that we knew the mom's name Jennifer was important because it was the wife of a minor character later on who then did not pick up the phone because he was busy helping Brett with some errand or another and thus missed the chance to have one last conversation with his dying wife, Um, which was a pretty cool inclusion. It didn't really get played for much emotional impact, but like, again, in concept, cool idea. There have to be other good things about this book. Um, yeah, so I mentioned in the summary briefly, but I did think President Prescott was probably the best character. Yeah. Um, he has the clearest goal to work towards. Um, he's relatable because of that goal. And he's shallow and he's callous. But, like, those are human descriptions. They're, like, emotional response evoking character traits that a reader can latch onto and engage with sure as opposed to someone like brett who's just like army man do an army thing he doesn't really have much to him and maybe that appeals to a certain kind of person but like i didn't like president prescott by any stretch but i understood him and that's more than i can say for like bubba (laughs) well okay well i love bubba but anyways but I i loved prescott's chapters because, like you said, um, I didn't really like the guy, but I could feel the the cynicism and the ambition just dripping out of everything he said. There's that scene where he's confronted with someone who is like demanding for answers as to why he's not really protecting the country, and he hugs her. If you just look at this, you know, this might be a pretty poignant uh, moment for... I guess solidarity or whatever you would want to call it. But we have his inner monologue where he's just like, Ooh, the cameras are going to love this. And man, if that's not compelling, you know? Yeah. I think that's a really good point. Uh, The inner monologue really makes his character. He's the most cerebral of the bunch. Right. Um, He's really thinking um, and planning and conniving. Getting to see that is not only, a factor that helps him be more relatable. It also provides some contrast to the more action driven characters like Brett, who are really are just kind of doing stuff, doing stuff. Well, all characters should be doing stuff. Otherwise it's a pretty boring story, Joshua. Yeah. Um, it is, isn't it weird? (laughs) We have to give credit where credit is due. There are a couple really banger lines um oh no 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 uh in soledad's first uh first uh chapter there we 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 quoted it in our um in our intermissions but they say nobody brings the swat team cookies that is at once really grabbing and kind of a good representation of soledad's character as a normal person who's brought into this really you know larger than life crazy situation um but unfortunately, I think a lot of the lines that I really liked, I liked them for reasons that, Ben, you probably didn't want us to. What was that? Uh, uh, when, this is so bad, when Levon first meets Big Jim Crawford, uh, he quotes Shakespeare, and Jim says, quoting dead honkies, which I think is so incredibly based but you know it's not necessarily i don't think that's why ben shapiro put that line in the book yeah i don't i don't know about that i i I feel like that's the one aave word that shapiro knows and so uh other than the n-word which is in here enough uh (laughs) no and so he was like yeah 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 that's that's something that this will make it seem real I just thought it was funny. legit and like like everything ashami said was so compelling and i was like yes you're so right king yeah ashami oh man oh man ashami he he was right but for the wrong reasons yeah he goes off on these like philosophical tirades that again idea wise they're interesting mm-hmm. but having him just say it like this while brett is like tied to a chair is too evocative of like the wrong kind of thriller 
it really undercuts the the grittiness. That's fair. Yeah, but I I think we're supposed to at least to some degree have that level of suspension of disbelief for those little bond moments i guess he just doesn't quite go in as hard as he should maybe i'm just not really sure i'm not sure what the tone is supposed to be because the the book opens with this like really horribly gory Mm -hmm. and evocative of real life tragedy scene of a bridge being blown up and a bunch of people like falling to their deaths and then in the next scene brett is like I don't know, playing a cover shooter essentially and like quipping to himself in his inner monologue. And then he's captured by this terrorist who's like, <laughs> so Brett Hawthorne, we finally meet. It's like, okay, I feel like a real terrorist would either just kill him so they could show his dead body on TV or would keep him alive, but like torture him horribly and not like waste time explaining his uh, interpretation of the Quran. Well, anyway. That's all good stuff. That's all good stuff. (laughs) stuff. It's all good. She choked back tears. How can we be really safe after this? My husband won't ever come back, probably, because you didn't keep us safe. He served his country in Vietnam, and he came back to this country, and all he asked was that our country honor his service. How can you keep us safe? She stared at him eyes glowing, and Prescott suddenly saw a way forward. He leaned forward, let a tear roll down his cheek, and hugged her. She tried to pull away initially. He held her tighter. Finally, he felt her sob against his chest, the tension going out of her body. The cameras flashed around him. The moment. Time stood still. This was the image he'd been seeking ever since his election. Compassionate. Caring. Strong. Now he waved for a couple of Secret Service agents to come forward and usher her from the stage. Well, Joshua, I think we did our best to come up with things that we liked about True Allegiance. Uh, You want to maybe walk us through some areas where Ben Shapiro could improve this great work of art? Okay. So I have alluded to it twice now. Um, I'm really chomping at the bit to talk about this Soledad opener section. Yes. um, In which her whole backstory is explained. And I think this is a symptom of a larger problem where every single character introduction chapter, and even when a minor character is being introduced and it's not their point of view chapter, we get like their whole history. This is stuff that should stay in the world building doc and only come out when it's absolutely relevant. (laughs) But in Soledad's chapter, it's especially offensive to me because there's some really good stuff here. And I feel like her story just doesn't need to be a part of this novel. It needs to be its own like lit fic style short story. Um, But the problem that I have with it is mainly that it has like several fake inciting incidents. Okay. So... For example, the story could be about the part where it says she clung harder to the land. It didn't produce anything anymore, but it was everything to her. She gradually sold off whatever was left of her cattle. She doggedly paid down the mortgage. She dropped her health insurance and her life insurance. Every last dollar went into buying the worthless barren stretch. So... This is land that's, like, ancestral to her. It's important to her. Mm -hmm. The inciting incident of this story could be when the federal government, you know, causes this dust bowl, quote-unquote, allegedly, by trying to protect the smelt. Yeah. And the story could really be self-contained within her just trying to futilely hold on to it and make it worth something, even though it's, like, literally killing her. Like, that could be its own story. It has really great potential, but instead it's told to us, like, in this really overlong narration that doesn't have any emotional impact. There's another fake inciting incident, sort of like a second false start, when a immigrant family that she had previously been sponsoring, but that she'd been forced to lay off when the money dried up along with the water, um, they, they moved to L.A. And uh, Emilio, that's the husband of the family and the guy that she had actually been sponsoring. His son is killed uh, in a high school in LA. And so she takes out yet more money to pay for his funeral. And that could really be the inciting incident 
of its own story, or it could be the inciting incident of this story. That could be the thing that radicalizes her. It could be a story about I don't I don't even know what about a rugged individualist. Of course, I had a I had a communist friend tell me once the only kind of individualism I like has the word rugged in front of it, and I think that's a really funny thing to say, and also a good through line for a lot of these characters in in, in True Allegiance. Yeah, I think so too. So at this point. We're like five pages into Soledad's chapter, right? And then the actual inciting incident happens, which is her deciding to bomb the uh, EPA. Right. While no one is there, don't worry. Oh, true. She's very insistent that it's uh, on a weekend, so no one's there. Because that's how that works, I guess. Like, the fact that it's a weekend guarantees literally no one will be present, and it'll be totally fine. Keeping in mind that this is not just five pages into her introductory chapter but also 45 pages into the novel as a whole. And we're still getting all of this backstory. And then her story doesn't even really go on to be about the thing that she has an emotional stake in. Like, for example, the ranch or the fate of Emilio or her hatred of the smelt. It goes on to be about like her being on the run from just the feds more generally um, and it's very impersonal. Narratively, she dies in maybe the 25% mark, and I'm being generous there. Yeah, so nothing that happens in her story is really, like, a direct result of the setup of her story, except for, like, the initial, like, flight from the ranch. Right. And then none of her, none of her actions impact the broader multiple point of view narrative either or she becomes basically a side character in these these you know white guy stories later on with the whole detroit art that's exactly what i mean because i think somebody might might have a counter argument to what i was saying and say like oh well it's her that frees uh officer o'sullivan right but it's not really um that's not really her idea or her story no. that's really aiden's story and she's just like also there and then the other thing that she actually does have a hand in, which is the assassination attempt on President Prescott's life, doesn't even really make sense for her character. Completely nonsensical. Does it came out of nowhere? Like, there's this moment where I think, like you were saying, it, it it's supposed to be the moment where she's radicalized. But, like, the emotional impact of that really isn't felt. Like, we don't get a sense that this is the moment where she's radicalized and now she's ready to kill the president. There's the, it really just comes out of nowhere and it ramps it up to 11 way too quickly. And all of the promise in the beginning of Soledad's, you know, character arc isn't delivered on. Yeah. And she really has no reason to kill the president. No, there's, there's this flimsy setup about how like, oh, she voted for him and she trusted him and she liked him, but now he's responsible for everything bad in America as if killing him is somehow going to solve that. Maybe it's the drone attack or something that sent her over the edge. I don't really, I don't really know how that. I think that's the implication. Like Aiden's death is the thing that pushes her over the edge, right. but we don't really see it. We know you can do it, Ben, because you have Prescott's really heady chapters where we can really figure out his entire motivation and follow that throughout. It's weird that you just shove this in here. Yeah, I think Soledad would have been another character that could have uh, really benefited from some strong internal monologue. Sure. That's a good jumping off point for probably my biggest thing. Ricky O'Sullivan should not be a POV character or even a major character. There is no way, even putting aside political beliefs right now, there is no way to humanize Ricky O'Sullivan in him killing an unarmed child. The scene doesn't work. He could walk away at any second. There's no reason that Ricky O'Sullivan should have pulled out his gun. And I think rather than even trying to write a scene in which it would be justified... You might as well just have all of this stuff happen off screen and your message will still be preserved and you can still have that element of, oh, this was all a scheme. But ironically, the last time in mainstream media someone tried to do this was Die Hard. And it didn't work there either, especially not today. Can you talk about that a little bit more? Yeah, yeah. In, in Die Hard? Yeah, yeah. So in Die Hard, one of the cops who's outside, not, you know, the main character, I can't remember his name. Uh, one of the cops who's outside kind of informing the main character on the events of the federal agents is kind of become a desk jockey. 
ever since this tragic moment in his life that we keep getting reminded of. And then finally he admits to what it is where he ran into a kid who looked like he was going to shoot him. The cop shot first and it turned out it was a toy gun. Like literally it's pretty much the exact same thing that happened in Ricky O'Sullivan's story. I don't know if it worked in the nineties, but it does not work today. It's hard to sympathize with him regardless of your political beliefs and I don't think it's even worth it to try in the case of Ricky O'Sullivan. It's absolutely not worth it. And it's like not even really an honest attempt at like fiction writing, I don't think. And I think it's, that's why this scene doesn't work is because it's not an attempt to tell a story. It's an attempt to convince readers that like they're justified in the beliefs that they already have. Like it's a piece of rhetoric as opposed to a piece of storytelling in fiction. And it shows through in like the shallowness of the writing. Like the scene itself is written so bizarrely. There's really no sense of escalation. Like for two pages... Ricky O'Sullivan and this kid just go back and forth. Like it's the same lines of dialogue exchanged over and over, just rephrased a bit. Like Ricky's like, put down the gun. And the kid's like, nah, you get out of here. And then Ricky's like, put down the gun. And the kid's like, no. <laughs> um, and then Ricky shoots him. Right. <laughs> it's like, oh. what? <laughs> and oh, oh, and then all of the denizens of Detroit descend upon him like like zombies in the night. It's so weird. And like even let, let's just be clear. I, I know what you're trying to do here, Ben, but it, it's not it's not even working on the level that you want it to just because of the unreality of it. It, it, it doesn't pass the sniff test. And, and I flatter anyone of a bent to be more apologetic of police violence to realize the the unreality of the scene that you wrote. Yeah, and I think um, that zombie thing that you mentioned is interesting because I had that exact same thought, even though the word zombie is not there. Um, and I think that's probably intentional on Ben's part because the way that uh, the, the citizens of Detroit, like descending on the gas station is described is so freaky and post-apocalyptic. I've got it here. <clears throat> For a brief moment, O'Sullivan couldn't breathe. When he looked up, he saw them coming. Dozens of them, the citizens of Detroit, coming out of the darkness, congregating. He could feel their eyes. Officer Ricky O'Sullivan sat down on the curb and began to cry. So, like, there's this really pathetic attempt to humanize him in the crying, uh, paired with this, like zombie imagery which is also evoked earlier in the chapter when the narration goes out of its way to make it clear that detroit is like this post-apocalyptic uh bombed out wasteland um so it's really impossible not to imagine like hordes of undead coming to i don't know point fingers at ricky o'sullivan for being an, an evil monster that killed a kid which is exactly what he is no, yeah, yeah, that's that's the problem is Levon is really justified in just about everything he, he does after that, yeah. you know, aside from engineering the whole conflict in the first place, but you know what I mean. It's just so bizarre. Like, that's not how these things happen. No. <laughs> like I said, doesn't pass the sniff test. I don't think there's there's really any way you could sell this correctly. So it's it's better just to, you know, save the space and have all this stuff happen off screen. You clearly trust so much in the reader to establish all of these things and in, in flashbacks and oblique references that it shouldn't be too hard yeah and i think that just leaving it off camera and making vague allusions to how something might be off about the whole thing would be good enough uh if you're hell-bent on having this setup which i think is in itself not a good setup right so let's just come clear with each other, Ben. I, we all kind of know why you wrote this book. Uh, we've made multiple references to the fact that this isn't so much a work of fiction as it is a piece of rhetoric that is trying to underscore your beliefs in how the world is working in the current day. The problem with that is that I think this book is not abstract enough to fully sell your point because with every assertion you make in you know to create this world you invite comparisons to real historical facts and i don't think it really pays off i remember talking about this in empress Teresa, where we were like it doesn't really make sense that real life middle eastern countries 
are being talked about here in a story so silly. And I think in the same vein, a layer of abstraction to where it becomes maybe more of a parable where we're not really talking about real countries having nuclear weapons. A lot of people will criticize you for denying, you know, the, that the, uh, what did Bush say? The absence of evidence isn't the evidence of absence. Uh, how you believe that Iran has nuclear weapons. Why not just have a fake country have nuclear weapons? And then we don't have to have all of these references to real life things. And we are more free to apply this worldview that you want us to have over the 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 world that we live in today. That's why I think that this novel is is really trying to go for something gritty and realistic and why it fails all the more whenever the characters quip at each other. It feels kind of marvelly. It does. It does feel marvelly. There were times where I felt like I was reading a spec script for like a Marvel movie but with the superheroes replaced with just like standard political guys <laughs> so, so ellen like dies in a nuclear explosion and brett's like so uh that just happened but but it's kind of gross to talk about all of these real countries with real people or even detroit like like talk we're talking about marvel movies what about dc like it's not it's not new york that is invaded by aliens and destroyed by superman it's metropolis and we are free to apply our own understanding of big cities like new york upon metropolis's example i I just think there are real people who come from iraq and iran and afghanistan who are not terrorists and are not anything like the the people that you present in your story and i was so caught up in thinking about that that the magic of your propaganda didn't necessarily work on me yeah and i mean I don't know exactly what Ben's fan base was like in when this not twenty sixteen, yeah twenty sixteen. Um, a lot's changed in the last six years, but it really it really does feel like all of those decisions were made because that's what Ben's fan base at least now would agree with or what they would already imagine, and so it just reinforces their perceptions. Um, right. Because it's not an attempt to write an earnest piece of thriller fiction. It's it's just uh, selling people the things that they already believe just repackaged into a novel. And I, I read a few reviews of this before before we came on today. And on Amazon, at least, like even the positive reviews, like several of them sound kind of negative. Um, People will give it like three or four stars and they'll say some nice things, but then they'll ultimately default to like, yeah, it didn't really grab me. Like it feels kind of hollow. Hollow is actually a great way to put it. It's it's we made a reference to it. So many straw men, so many missed opportunities for depth on both sides. Honestly, even trigger warning was a better piece of conservative propaganda just because of, I guess the I, I guess you would say the human element. Or at least the lack of 15 POV characters. I don't know exactly what made Trigger Warning succeed while the other failed. Um, you shouldn't be racist, Ben Shapiro. I think that's kind of the the big thing for me in all of this. Well, he's not racist. He made Obama white. <laughs> well, that's just because he mixed him with so, Bill Clinton. So, so chew on that, liberal. <laughs> your, your move. Oh my god. Oh, we can talk about the media. Okay. Like we mentioned uh, a little earlier, the media plays a very odd role in this story. Um, So from the beginning of Brett's point of view, there's there's this character who I don't think ever does anything on screen, but pops up off screen a couple times. Um, A journalist who had been like his confidant and then in a politically convenient moment turned on him. Um, and accused him of sexual assault in order to, like, defame him for her own political gain. Um, so in that instance, like, she represents, like, the, the traitorousness of the media. But then the uh, then during other times, the media is, like, this more, like, nebulous force right. of, like, evil, basically. Which, you know, kind of kind of real, but also I don't think quite the extent to which Ben Shapiro believes it is. Which is an interesting perspective for him to have as a member of the media. Yeah, I feel like it says something bad about Ben to imply that, like, the media is, like, fully in the hands of, how does he put it, power brokers. 
Um, yeah, at the beginning of one of Prescott's early chapters, I think it's actually the first one, <clears throat> he's described as a product of the Chicago machine, the hand-picked protege of power brokers. He campaigned on great blustering clouds of rhetoric, his boyish good looks, and a record obscured by a complacent media. So, like, the media is complacent in that they don't look into Prescott's past and find whatever dirt he's hiding, but they're also, like, simultaneously so powerful that they can, like, ruin a career in other cases. Um, so, like, are they complacent and stupid, or are they extremely powerful and always operating in the shadows to support the aims of, you know, these, like, shady individuals who themselves aren't really referenced much other than these, like, vague allusions to, like, you know, somebody. Right. Well, I think the real answer is they're just a nebulous force that Ben references whenever he feels like it in whatever way underscores his point the most. Yeah, I think that's a problem. Um, the role of the media is just sort of inconsistent. Yeah. Like, in the case of uh, the lady that defamed Barrett, like, the media is extremely intelligent and conniving and powerful. But then at the same time, they're also stupid and oblivious and, like, easily bought. So which is it? Well, life is full of those little dualities, I think. That's so true. I wonder if that's what Ben would say. Yeah, maybe maybe he's trying to be true to life in that regard. We can all be stupid and easy to buy out sometimes. I think the problem is that like there needs to be more nuance in what is meant when the when the phrase the media is used. Like maybe that phrase shouldn't even be used at all because Sure. The the media can't be both of these things, but like different news outlets could be. Like, this book does reference MSNBC specifically a couple of times and Fox News. And every time it mentions MSNBC and even Fox, it talks about them being, like, kind of gullible and kind of just repeating whatever is told to them by people in power. I don't know. My brain is melting. Um, good luck editing this. <laughs> Prescott smiled wryly as Tommy hovered around the set like a mother hen. Tommy had done yeoman's work. This morning, he had spent two hours on the phone with the Chinese government, trying to convince him to buy more U.S. debt. He'd achieved his purpose. It had been surprisingly easy. Shockingly easy, actually. All that was left was to ram through the legislation, which is where the camera came in. Republicans in Congress and some Democrats in red states were skeptical of the plan. They'd cave eventually, Prescott knew. They always did. They just needed a push. A good, hard push. Mr. President, said Bradley, you're on in two. Bradley shooed away the makeup artist, a hot number in her mid-twenties, exactly the kind of girl Prescott's wife hated. As Bradley was about to push her out the door of the Oval Office, Prescott laughed. Tommy, just calm down. We've done this a thousand times, he said. Let the young lady stay. Then he winked at her. She fluttered her eyelashes. So Ben, normally in this section, we talk about our suggestions for how you can improve this book while keeping it true to your vision. But I struggled a lot with this because I couldn't quite pin down exactly what your intentions are for this story. I believe this is intended to be propaganda. You know, you, this is almost insidious in the way that it works. I talked earlier in my positives about how my monkey brain was able to just kind of follow the emotional crescendo and when you follow it all the way to the end, I can only describe the epilogue as a call to arms in some civil war that doesn't necessarily exist anywhere but in your conception of how the world works. I've compared it to Trigger Warning a couple times. These are two stories that are conservative in their political leaning, and... While Trigger Warning is a caricature of the college liberal system and in so doing kind of satirizes conservative ideology itself, this is more on the side of you are trying to further an agenda that is within the ideology that you're presenting. There's there's an energy behind this book. You could you could almost say that it it, it glows. The thing about Trigger Warning 2 was the amount of clear dog whistles within the text. We talked about how 
there is no way that William Johnstone would actually know what a patriarchal microaggression is, let alone how to use it in a sentence. And through that, we can kind of determine that this book was written by someone who is within that world and is at least educated in its terminology. And I drove myself crazy looking for dog whistles in this book. And I made a list of them. So a very large man is described as a bear, which can only be read homosexually, which is really funny to come from Ben Shapiro. And then um, in one of President Prescott's speeches, he says, like, the American people will be unbowed and unbent and unbroken, which is the, uh, those are the house words of House Martell in A Song of Ice and Fire. Those are the two ones I was able to find. I And, like, I, I just couldn't get that sense of who was actually talking to me, which is what made reading True Allegiance such a such a weird and alien experience, even in comparison to Trigger Warning, which, you know, isn't also necessarily my cup of tea. Yeah, I mean, the potential for this to be troll fic, I would say, is far, far less. I'm not saying I think Ben Shapiro actually penned this himself, um, but I don't know that whoever did was necessarily that uh, ideologically, like, disaligned with him. Sure. Or the corporate overlords paid him too much. That's, yeah, something like that. It just feels so bland. You know, I often wonder when we read books by uh, novice writers, like I'm, I'm thinking in particular of Empress Teresa, um, like to what degree the things that come out in those books are manifestations of like, sort of like psychological processes that the author is like maybe not fully self-aware about. Like, like I don't know to what degree Norman is necessarily aware that like he has a certain... Uh, desires when it comes to <laughs> certain types of women uh if you get what i'm saying and i don't know how much of a role that plays here because ben shapiro is certainly not like a newbie writer but there's like there's a through line of conspiracy and mistrust that i found really interesting as i was reading this um so from from things like Ricky O'Sullivan's arrest being like a sting operation by by uh, I don't know left wing operatives working behind the scenes, to President Prescott's like uh, social programs that would ostensibly have positive workings uh, like on the greater American public, being not motivated by altruism but by like a, a sort of careerism. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder like if that's reflecting something about like. Ben being a deeply mistrustful person. I almost wonder, like, if that conspiracy element could be leaned into harder. Like, what else is a conspiracy, you know, if these things are a conspiracy? Um, I mean, even the media in this book feels like a conspiracy. Like, Brett being defamed by this uh, journalist is a political play, and nothing happens in the light, really. Everything is happening in the shadows. Um, and I think that if this book was going to be fully committed to like a political thriller, there could be more. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you had compared it to James Bond. And just to be honest, that completely escaped me when I was reading it. But now that you mention it, I think the skeleton of a more espionage thriller is there. You just never had time to really dive into it because you don't need Ricky O'Sullivan to really, you know, flesh out what it could mean to be your kind of a spy thriller. Yeah, I think, yeah, you, you got me there. I was, I was, I think I was about 70% of the way there, but you said the word spy and that's really what's missing is, is an element of espionage. Like this is at its core. I think it wants to be a spy thriller. I mean, Brett doesn't really act like how we would expect like a general to act. I feel like no. he's not really like out, out in the field um, except for, you know, at the beginning of the book, he's not like in boardrooms strategizing over boring plans. He's really like running around dark buildings and taking people out behind the scenes and, um, 
invading people's personal privacy to, you know, investigate whatever they've been up to and how they're connected to this, uh, again, conspiracy of Islamic terrorists threatening the U.S. Right. Um, so I don't, I don't think it would be that hard to remold him as a spy. It could be like a Winter Soldier. It would open interesting avenues for Ellen as well. I liked her being a soldier's wife, but if she had even more of that melodrama of having her husband be the spy, it could be, it could be really interesting for her. I mean, I think there's potential for her to be a spy too. Spy couple, yeah. Maybe a double agent. There's interesting possibilities for her working for Bubba and interesting possibilities for her working for Prescott, you know, in terms of like who she's like truly allied with, um, if she were to be a double agent. I just, I, throughout all of this, I'm just thinking, I don't know if Ben Shapiro is too smart, but you're definitely too educated for this to be a work of outsider art on the level of Empress Teresa and the machinations that created you are a little bit more real and complicated than the machinations that re- led J.A. Johnstone to create a joke novel. So it's it's a real struggle to pin down exactly where you fit in in English Club's pantheon. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly not a work of outsider art. Um works of outsider art don't become i don't know hardcover amazon best-selling thrillers um it would take a, a real grass smooth grassroots movement of uh irony loving readers for that to be achieved i think <laughs> i think we're getting to that point where we might have that one day i'm optimistic yeah i mean no that, that's a great future i love that for us but i don't know if we're quite there yet you know, if if we're cutting Ricky O'Sullivan, though, like you were saying, I think yeah. um, so- Soledad might as well go as well. She really doesn't fit in this story, and I think she would thrive in her own story that's really about her war on the EPA. Yeah, I, I think that's a really good compromise. I like Soledad, even in this book I do, but I do recognize how much she detracts from kind of the, the spine of the story through Brett's storyline. But she's she's fun and she sells your ideology, Ben, of this this individualist libertarian just wants to feed her cows, damn it, kind of woman. And I I think there's a level of passion and interest there that I found compelling. But maybe you're right, Joshua. It's not that narratively cohesive. It's really not. I mean, I think th- these people are all like maybe rugged individuals, like you're saying, but her kind of rugged individuality is really a libertarian one, like libertarian in the truest sense, where she wants to just be left alone to do her thing. Um, and she doesn't want outside entities interfering with that mission of of self-fulfillment, essentially. Um, she's grill-pilled. Th- yeah, she's grill-pilled. Uh, I don't subscribe to that ideology personally, but like it's a coherent one that could be argued for in the form of like a good story. Sure. Um, but it doesn't have space to breathe in this book which is really more about the political drama and Soledad's connection to that like broader nationwide political drama is really, it's fairly strong at first with her rivalry with the EPA. And then it's weak as she's just sort of on the run. And then it's a little bit stronger again when she gets roped directly into rescuing Ricky O'Sullivan from prison. Mm -hmm. But like, again, that's not really her story. So it feels flimsy and hollow. And ultimately, hollow is kind of the best word to describe this book. Well, you know what? I don't know if we can't just add on some more fat and flesh out some of these characters. This is a short, short book, especially for the level of points of views it has. It really is. There's five major points of view in about 250 pages. So if every character was getting equal pages, you know, they'd be each getting 50 pages. And I don't really think that's enough for any of these characters to get the screen time that they need to sort of uh, play out their necessary functions in this propaganda play. But Ben, I I think it might be worth you trying to make this book a little bit physically fatter before we make big cuts. I I think this is a very unique situation, or at least in regards to other submissions to English Club in the past, where the solution has been to trim the fat. I think we're we're on such a flimsy beginning in the first place that let's see what happens when we add some stuff to this foundation before we start completely changing the building. At the same time, though, I think that um, a lot of the backstory that we get can honestly just be cut and pasted right back into the world building doc. 
and uh, we can uh, sprinkle some of those necessary details in as needed. Sure. But we do not need an introductory set of five pages for every single point of view character. And we certainly don't need paragraphs to pages of introductory text for minor characters who die unceremoniously in a hotel room in the shower. <laughs> oh man. And I don't know if it ever really, that ever really goes anywhere with who kills him. I like it all happens so fast and there's so many stakeholders that it's just impossible to follow. There's so many characters and there's like, I, I feel like there's a real like concerted effort being made to make every single one of them like memorable and punchy. And like, mm-hmm. this is going to be somebody's favorite side character. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like I get that vibe. Well, you know, it, it, it kind of did work in a way. I was, I also read some reviews, watched some videos before this and every single one of them had a different least favorite character. Oh, great. So by corollary, <laughs> you know, the, everyone would have a different favorite character. Yeah, I guess that's true uh, in a sort of a process of elimination kind of way. Like you have to have a favorite if you just get rid of all the ones that are your least favorite. The imminent threat of every foreign country to America really undermined your central message or at least made it seem a lot more silly and fear-mongering than i think would have been appropriate uh we mentioned that the border is seen as you know the wet paper bag of america and just one little drop of a gang age child will bring the whole thing down but also right at the epilogue China, who is only ever mentioned as kind of an entity that Prescott sells debt to, forms a coalition and launches an invasion of the United States, which is kind of a crazy thing to wrap your head around, even in the narratives world, just because of how little anything like that was established. So we have to assume that it's just the state of being that anywhere outside of the United States is a second away from all out war. Well, I mean, in the first chapter, even they even describe Brett's motivation for joining the army as being somebody who's going to defend America from the barbarians that are at the gates, which really sets up this like oppositional tone between America and everywhere. That's not America. Right. But, like, speaking apolitically, that's such a flimsy stance to take. And I know that Ben is capable of nuance because of characters like Levon, where they are doing based things in cringe ways. Uh-huh. I, I know that you have the capability of presenting foreign countries as not just being barbarians at the gates. And conservatively speaking it undermines your 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 central point to dehumanize these people uh, even if you're trying to present this nationalistic view of things even on like a narrative level it doesn't make sense for china to not really have any role in the story and then suddenly become like one of the most present threats at the last second yeah the last thing is from the point of view of an admiral who's on the way to invade the united states it's crazy like where are you coming up with this thing it really almost feels like i mean as I was reading it, I didn't get this sense. But then as I was reading the epilogue, I got the sense that like the real story Ben wanted to tell or whoever's writing this wanted to tell is whatever hypothetically comes in the second book. Because this all in hindsight feels like set up for something else. The, it's all set up for the real life that we are supposed to interpret after reading this book. I just think you could have done a better job of it. Yeah, this is honestly the most tragic of the stories that we've had in English Club because it has the least capacity to be better. I don't think that's a function of any technical inability on your part. I think that's a failure of tone and message cohesion. Yeah, I I think there's like maybe a lack of vision, but like... It's like a thing that maybe didn't have the clearest vision going into it, but now it's been polished to a point where it is a complete thing. It's just that the complete that the complete thing is like so fundamentally flawed that it would be really hard to start at an earlier point and fix it from then on. So as much as I am a fan of the add more stuff on and see what sticks approach, it might be a good idea as well to consider doing a hack job. 
like Joshua said, you can consider doing one-off, maybe more lit fic short stories with your more compelling characters, or take each of them under a microscope and see where it goes. If you can combine that into one book, that would be fantastic. But, you know, maybe these characters need space, and maybe these concepts need grounding in a little bit more facts and logic than you were able to give them. Yeah, I really don't think these characters are doing each other any favors, like having to play in the same room on the same stage. I think that they would thrive better in their own little vignettes. Which is a tragedy when you build something so complex and interrelated, but it's also an illustration of the fact that no writing is really wasted. There's enough good in here that even if the cohesive whole doesn't quite work together, that we can isolate and build off of. And I think that's a lesson that we can all take home, no matter how bad the things that we write are. There's probably some seed that can germinate into something better. Yeah, I mean, if Ben, like, takes the lessons that he learned from writing this book and attempts to write another preferably unrelated piece of propaganda fic, just think of how much better it'll be for having, you know, written all the garbage out, so to speak. Um, Think of how much more it could fool us into believing his weird, reprehensible ideologies. <laughs> well, we have to, it's our mission as as English club members to improve the books as they are, not create what we wish they would be. As And as, as reprehensible and wrong as every belief presented in this book is, I don't think that we are at point to quash it. Well, that's certainly not our goal here. Um, this book was submitted to us directly by Ben Shapiro himself, and uh, due to the sacred pact that we signed in our own blood, we can't turn down even a single submission and must go through them in the order received. So um, that's what we're doing. For all the good it does us. You know, there's these weird moments where it seems like the book is just outright telling you what its theme is. So, for example, during some random Soledad chapter, she's talking to Aiden, and uh, he says, It isn't American to do those things. America means more than being born here. It means believing certain things. And then she says, So we should shoot those who disagree? And he says, Only if they shoot first. And it just sets up such a... Like you were saying earlier, like alien to me worldview, where everything is constantly on the precipice of tipping into just deadly violence. You know, do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, no, absolutely. It's it's definitely uh, an interesting and a little bit depressing worldview to have to think that we're all so close to just all out chaos. And not just that, but like in order to be American, you must believe, you must subscribe wholeheartedly to this specific set of beliefs. And anybody who holds different beliefs is not American. I just, that that's sad. I don't know. I don't really have anything deeper to say about it. It's just like, it just kind of makes you feel down inside. And that's why, that's the point of the epilogue is he beats you down and then shows you you know, this war that's coming and is implicitly holding out his hand, asking you to take a side that it's insidious. And and that's why I struggled so much with this book is, is the, the cold cynicism and the, the naked propaganda of this entire story. If we're going with my theory earlier about some of these like amateur novels revealing uh, psychological secrets about their author, it makes me think that Ben must be like a very paranoid person who's really afraid of everything that's like outside himself. You know, like we have all these characters that are victims of conspiracy or are the so themselves the perpetrators of conspiracy that then victimizes other innocents. And then we have this worldview where where, you know, it's America and it's everything else. And everything outside of America is a threat. And then at the same time, even within America, if you don't believe a certain set of beliefs, you're not American and are therefore, like, a threat that is going to devolve into deadly violence. You're the barbarian in the gate, like a little Trojan horse, but democratic. (laughs) Like a a Trojan donkey. That's the Democrat one, right? I think. I don't know. (laughs) Dear Lord, I know I haven't spoken with you for a while, 
but I need you now. I may never forgive you for what you did to my Ellen, why you took our baby from us. They say you have a logic all your own, and I reckon that's the case, since I sure as hell can't understand you or the things you do. I know I've tried to do the right thing as I see it, and I haven't broken too many of the lessons I learned in Sunday school. And you know better than anybody that I've never been one for prayer. I always thought that some people treat you like a gumball machine, and if they pray just the right way and say just the right things, that you'll give them what they want, when this whole world is about something bigger than what any of us want. It's about what you want, and I do hope that I've done at least a few things the way you want them. But now I'm not praying for myself. I'm praying for Ellen, because after this, she's going to be alone, Lord, and I just want her to be happy. You took her children away from her. Maybe I took myself away from her. But however it worked out, she'll be on her own. Please let her find someone else. Please let her be happy for once in her life. Please let my sweetheart go on with her life. Let her understand what I've done and why I've done it. Thank you, Lord, in advance. Amen. Well, Ben, I'm sure you're not really happy to hear the lukewarm response to your novel. I, I know that anything that someone creates kind of becomes their child, and it's very hard to... Honestly, it's more difficult to receive a middling reaction than a negative reaction sometimes because it can feel like such a uh, it can feel like such an invalidation of you as a person I, my hope is that this isn't devastating to you i hope that you can somehow you know grow from this and create a better story from the ashes but i just think that this is the wrong the wrong environment to tell this story the wrong way to tell the story and in some ways, it's the wrong story to tell. Yeah, I mean, it's it's trying so hard to be politically, like, current that even now, six years later, it feels dated and played out. Um, it, it feels so of its time, but not in a really charming way that brings you back to the era. It feels like, it, it, it feels locked into the year 2016, like it's not relevant anymore. Right, a lot of these threats that you've given us have never come to pass and that undermines its legitimacy as a story or as a propaganda piece which you clearly wanted it to be more so than it was a novel so i don't know what to tell you man just let's see where we can build from the 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 little parts of this that show some promise yeah ben um i just think you know keep writing um maybe circle back around to those screenplays um give those another shot you never know when the Hollywood elite might change their mind and uh, uh, be interested in picking up one of your spec scripts. Uh, it's never too late. Um, you got that Daily Wire streaming platform thing going for you now. Like maybe you could write up a little show, pop it on there. Yeah. I, I don't know, man. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of stuff you can do. Sure. I mean, when you're a multimillionaire funded by like fracking billionaires then uh world's your oyster <laughs> so you'll be fine ben uh, but i do hope that you come back one day and tell us all about how your journey as a writer has grown but for now i think it's just about time that we head over to the student union for some dinner my fellow americans it's me president prescott it's been an honor to attend this uh meeting of the saint balasar university english club uh, thank you all for being here. I can't wait until you die horribly in a nuclear explosion. <laughs> but anyways, we will see you guys around campus. See you guys. Remember to like and subscribe. Share us with all of your friends. Be sure to comment your favorite and least favorite point of view character of True Allegiance by Benjamin Shapiro. See you guys on the quad. On the quad. Does St. Ballester University have a quad? Dude, it's got quads for days. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll see you wherever that is. Brett went silent. Ramirez started the engine. For what it's worth, I'm sorry about your wife, General Hawthorne. I'm sorry for this country. 
I'm not sorry what happened to Prescott. None of that matters. Where are we going? I figure you're the general. You pick. He looked to the horizon again, to the murky cloud of ash blotting out the rising stars. He set his jaw in a look Ellen would have recognized instantly as unshakable determination. Let's head west, he said. I'm going home. God, this book is so soy-pilled. He's so soy-pilled! <laughs>